Hey there, I am in Dover, Ohio, outside of the Warther Museum, and this is dedicated to a man named Ernest Mooney Warther, and uh, he can be considered the world's master wood carver. Uh, he did some really incredible work, and a lot of his stuff is displayed here, along with his uh, wife's collection of buttons, and I think you can go inside the home too. So um, this is gonna be really cool. Let's go check this out. Ernest Warther was born here in Dover in 1885 to Swiss immigrant parents. He grew up taking neighbors' cows to the pasture and bringing them into town for milking every evening to earn money for him and his widowed mother. He would go to school on the days the weather was bad and eventually completed a second grade education. This is his workshop, 8 by 10 feet. He built this workshop outside of his house, and it's where he did much of his work. It is left exactly how it was, and you can see the extensive arrowhead collection. On one of these trips to the pasture, he found a penknife and began to whittle, and on another one, he met a hobo who showed him how to carve a pair of pliers from a single piece of wood which he memorized and later perfected. In 1899, at age 14, he began to work at the steel mill in Dover and worked there for 23 years and carved in the evenings. This is a carving of the steel mill he worked at, and he made six of these. It's mechanical and still runs to this day. Truly impressive. These are examples of his pliers. These are made up from a single block of wood, and he could do it quickly with just 10 simple cuts. When it was folded up, it looked like this. And these are the world's largest Warther pliers. This tree is an extension to that plier design. A huge extension, in fact. There are 511 interconnected pliers carved from a single block of wood. And this can all fold up perfectly, just like the shape of the small pliers. This required about 31,000 cuts, and each branch can function as pliers. Some math, ew, professors from Case University came to study it and basically declared it impossible. But somehow, it is. This room showcases his famous locomotives. He really enjoyed railroad history, so this became his major project. This was his favorite, the 1933 Great Northern Mountain Locomotive, which has 7,752 parts. These are made from walnut and ebony wood, and most of these have beef bone, but some have ivory, especially the later ones. There is the General, the locomotive used in the famous Civil War railroad chase. He mainly became interested in the railroad because he had books on locomotives and the railroad with him, and so he read what he had. All of these are accurate models of real historical locomotives and trains. All parts have exact features that are scaled in proportion to the actual size. 
1923, he quit his job at the steel mill because the New York Central Railroad offered to have him tour the country with his carvings, which he did, and they were later displayed at Grand Central Terminal in New York City. He got offered huge sums of money by the New York Central Railroad and others like Henry Ford and the Smithsonian for the purchase of these trains, but he denied every offer and kept them, and that's why they're still here at this family-run museum. Ford also wanted the family to move to Greenfield Village, set up a shop there as a living exhibit, and also permanently live there. But he wouldn't leave his home here for all the money in the world. After the tour, he was able to produce his unique knives and sell them to supplement his income, and unlike store-bought knives, these would stay sharp. He never did become rich, even though he could have been a millionaire. There's the Union Pacific Big Boy. He would set a time frame that he would commit to and stick with when working on these. He would set the date that the project would be completed, and he always finished them in time except for two exceptions. These are Lincoln canes he made in the 20s. He would carve a ball on the inside without reapplying anything on the outside, and he said he would give the cane to whoever could touch the ball. And as you can see, the canes are still here. A Lindbergh cane, made after his transatlantic flight, he was the biggest celebrity at that time. This is the Empire State Express carved from ivory. It would go from New York City to Buffalo in seven hours, starting in 1892. Even the interiors of many of these are included, and this has ivory carved people in it. This is the Golden Spike Ceremony at Promontory Point, Utah, where Leland Stanford joined the rails of the First Continental Railroad. In 1869, one of the biggest events in railroad history. In my opinion, this was his masterpiece, an exact replica of the Lincoln Funeral Train. 
He made this when he was 80 years old. It's an amazing replica of the Baltimore and Ohio locomotive and train cars that carry the body of the assassinated president and his son Willie who died in 1862 from DC to several cities for funeral ceremonies from April 21st to May 3rd of 1865 when it finally arrived in Springfield, Illinois. And there is the open casket of an ivory Abraham Lincoln. If you can't tell, Ernest really admired Abraham Lincoln. I think this is supposed to be a carving of the Lincoln Memorial. Some real crepe tinsel and cloth from Lincoln's casket and a star from the funeral train car. Here are some more trains he did in his last years. That's a train being driven by Casey Jones. So those are the works of an unschooled and untrained master craftsman whose works defy explanation. He was working on this one when he died on June 6, 1973, at age 87. And this is the Warther family home. This is where they lived. The workshop would have been somewhere in here. And we're gonna go look at that now. The Warthers lived in this home for 63 years. See, this is their front parlor. Some buttons, of course. There's a portrait of Mooney up there. This room is the library. There's another collection of arrowheads. And uh, Mooney used this as his workshop in uh, the winter of 1920 because it was apparently very cold. So there's a bust of Shakespeare and a player piano. They set up this room to be Frida's button collecting room as she would probably uh, make her elaborate button patterns in here. With a bunch of her work left in here. And this was their kitchen. Looks very vintage. Even their shed is now a display of Frida's buttons. Frida would design uh, the patterns of the buttons and also of the arrowheads. So many buttons. Jeez. That center button right there is very important because it was a part of Mary Todd Lincoln's uh, gown that she wore at Lincoln's second inauguration in 1865. Before Goodyear made tires and blimps, they made buttons and that's what uh, these are all from. These are all pre-tire Goodyear buttons in the shape of a blimp. Look at this one, 1956 Bugs Bunny. Help crippled children. This was their grape arbor. It's where they would uh, sit every Sunday. 
There's a pair of shoes hanging from a chain connecting two trees that the sycamores have eaten up. Weird. That's a pretty big birdhouse up there. And the Warthers have a caboose in their backyard on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Now I think a train actually came by here. This building may have been moved to the site, but uh, that's where Mooney got some of his inspiration for his carvings. Just because I think the actual railroad came by here. So the Warther Museum is really incredible. Such a talented folk artist. Um, but if you like this video, you like museums and roadside attractions and art, then please go check out my other videos and thanks for watching.